this show, these reviews, and this channel wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the awesome people over at my Patreon. Become a part of the community and support my content by heading over to patreon.com slash Kev. So, you know, sometimes while I'm trying to fall asleep, I'll browse through Netflix or Amazon or Pureflix, perhaps, searching for hidden gems, you know? It's fun because discovering a movie that I've never heard of for free, basically, kind of offsets any sort of negativity I would normally have towards that movie. It's really fascinating how circumstances surrounding the moment in which you watch a film can affect how you feel about the film itself. For example, if all year long I had been looking forward to the film, What Happened to Monday? Then I walked into the theater, paid the $15, I would have been thoroughly disappointed. But since I'd never heard of the movie at all until I watched it late one night on Netflix, and I don't necessarily recommend the film, by the way, even still, I found it enjoyable enough. It's a creative idea, if nothing else. My point is, I was able to look past a lot of the awkward dialogue, weird plot holes, kind of forced exposition, and clunkiness of the, you know, a lot of problems with the film, I was able to look past because of the unique circumstances that I was in. I'm sure many of you have experienced this, where you found a unique, fun, enjoyable hidden gem. And then there's The Commuter, a film that is so atrociously awful. I don't think anything, even in those special, unique, wonderful circumstances where bad movies can seem like good movies because you're watching them with low expectations. Even if I had watched the very video you're watching of my own review, I still wouldn't have been prepared for how utterly vapid, pointless, and hollow this film truly is. Nothing could prepare me for the garbage of The Commuter. All right, maybe I'm being a little hyperbolic and maybe I've been watching too much I Hate Everything, but seriously, this movie is awful. And it's not even because it had a low budget and it's not like they didn't have access to the talent. This movie is awful because it could be good and it does everything wrong. It's like it actively chooses not to care. It's the biggest screw you audience. Look, it's Liam Neeson. You people will go see any rehash of Taken a thousand times over, won't you? Won't you? Here's Taken on a plane, Taken on a train, Taken during the Holocaust, Taken with wolves, Taken in Narnia. Is this Taken? Probably. Who cares? Taken, Taken, take it! What, there's a TV show too? <laughs> Come on. So the movie starts off with basically a montage. It's Liam Neeson going through his everyday life. Look, he's commuting, get it? Because the movie's called The Commuter. So Liam Neeson plays an ex-cop, again. Yeah. Turned insurance salesman. Right off the bat, they don't make him very likable because he kind of manipulates these people into buying life insurance. My wife, Karen, and I, we worked hard, did everything right. In 2008, we lost it all. The one thing we didn't cut was our life insurance policy. So you don't really feel bad when, out of the blue, he gets canned from his job after 10 years at the company. And five years from retirement. I'm 60 years of age. What is a guy with an inexplicably vaguely Irish accent going to do? Seriously, I, I don't know if he's supposed to be playing an American anymore, and I'm pretty positive he doesn't know either. Or at least he doesn't care because paycheck, which is fine. I mean, honestly, I can't blame Liam Neeson for keeping on making the these kinds of movies. He does have a very particular set of skills and he's probably willing to do anything to make sure he takes care of his family. So feeling bad about losing his job, he heads down to the bar where he randomly bumps into his ex-partner. For seven years we were partners. You always have my back. And that's where we get all kinds of setup for the movie. It's a corrupt world, my friend. No good being the little guy. It ain't just cops being cops anymore, you know? It's it's politics, favors, choosing a midnight sign. He then runs into another officer who we are not supposed to like because the movie tells us he, we're not supposed to like him. He's the worst and now he is made captain. What? Yeah, he made captain. Ugh, gross. Michael. David, it's been a while. He's played by Sam Neill. I guess this is Clash of the Vaguely American Accents. All right, I'm not making fun of people with vaguely American accents. I'm just making fun of this particular guy because I'm not supposed to like him. I'm supposed to hate this guy so much, and I do, because the movie told me to. Hey, you brick. So if you're wondering why Liam Neeson isn't a cop anymore, stop it. Okay, stop, stop it. it. It doesn't matter. It's just how it's supposed to be. In a movie like this, it doesn't tell you. <laughs> I don't think. The movie seems to know it's going through the motions, so much so that at one point, this character just kind of says, hey, Don't you have a train to catch? Yes. As if to say, hey, uh, isn't this taken on a train? You better not miss the main catalyst for the plot. So we hop on the train and Neeson starts getting hit on by this woman. Hello. It's my first time on a commuter train. I'm sorry, have we met? No, I'm Joanna. Michael. Michael. 
I'm married. But she acts like she wasn't really hitting on him because I study human behavior. I'm a conversationalist. <laughs> she just hits on people for science. So she pitches this super contrived and convoluted hypothetical science question to Neeson. It's just a simple hypothetical question. Which I feel would be similar to how the pitch for this movie would have been if Liam Neeson wasn't tied to the project. Because, you know, with him tied to the project, all they have to say is, it's, it's taken on a train. What if I asked you to do something that you are uniquely qualified to do, meaningless to you, but it could profoundly affect an individual on this train, and you would never know the consequences of what you did? Would you do it? What? Why would I do it? Right, exactly. There would be a reward. What's the reward? She tells him that in this hypothetical scenario, if he does this thing, there will be $25,000 in the bathroom of the train. And despite the scenario that she proposes being con convoluted and confusing, it's so obvious to the audience that the movie wants you to believe that this isn't an actual hypothetical situation, that it's a real thing that she's saying, but Neeson hasn't quite figured it out quite yet. So she lays down the ground rules for the supposed intellectual thought experiment. Someone on this train does not belong. All you have to do is find them. This person is carrying a bag. Inside that bag is something they have stolen. Don't leave the train before finding the bag. Don't tell anyone about this offer. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, 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 slow down. This is like Samson's riddle. It's not that I'm not clever for not being able to figure it out. It's that you haven't given me enough details. There's not any information here. On this train, there is somebody. Find that person and then you can go grab some money. Bye! No, this is dumb. What this lady says is so vague and pointless that I kept on waiting for the movie to reveal that either she's crazy or he's just hallucinating everything. But no, the movie actually expects us to be on board with this. I thought this was hypothetical. But then it's not a hypothetical. It's real! It's real, everyone. Mom! It's real! It shouldn't be too hard for next cop. What? How did she know? You have until next stop to decide. What kind of person are you? So any rational person would say, okay, sounds shady. Seems like an impossible task to do. How am I supposed to just find some random person on a train with a duffel bag with no description of who or why or what or when? It doesn't make any sense at all. This is stupid. But I guess Neeson just did lose his job and he isn't thinking straight because he's got a family to feed, you know? So he finds the money in the bathroom and he takens it. You're kidding me. Big mistake, I guess, because that wasn't part of the rules. I thought that was part of the rules, but maybe she should have just said like, hey, find this person and then I'll tell you where the money is. And then we proceed to find out how elaborate this whole plan really is. Neeson tries to get off the train, but he's stopped by this girl who gives him his wife's wedding ring. Oh no! To show that she's been taken and to prove they're really serious, they kill this guy on the street. So Neeson realizes he's got to use his special skills to find out who this person is. Skills like figuring out a seating graph, looking at ticket stubs, and creepily walking down the the aisles on the train. Wow. And so he goes through one by one trying to find who the person is that he's supposed to find without any details other than where they'll be getting off. And then the movie just goes through the motions from there. It turns out that the person he's supposed to be finding is a witness to a crime and the police are behind that crime or something. And oh no, if the police are behind it, it's probably the bad captain, right? I mean, that's gotta be the guy. It's clearly the guy who we were told that we're supposed to not like at the very beginning. So then from there, the movie basically becomes Clue and and not the movie Clue, it becomes like watching somebody play the game Clue by themselves. Most of the rest of the movie is just him interviewing different people and mistaking different passengers as the passenger he's supposed to find. The lady right here? Uh, mistaken. The young girl with the pink hair at the window? Uh, mistaken. Mr. Goldman Sachs over there? Uh, mistaken. My friend with the guitar? Uh, mistaken. Wow, this has been embarrassing. I mean, we get a few generic action scenes of Neeson punching some people with a bunch of jump cuts. If I remember correctly, he in some way or another tries to beat up all five of these people who he thinks the person is. At one point, Neeson finds himself underneath the train, but he has to jump off and jump back on. That was pretty cool, I guess. But all of this is offset by the weird omnipotence that the bad guys seem to have. They've got so many secret planted agents on the train, they just keep popping up over here and over there. Why don't they just get one of these people to do what Neeson's been asked to do. What's so special about this insurance salesman? I want to talk to my wife and my son. You've proven yourself capable. 
figure it out. Oh, this lady. So the lady that they cast to play this role, she works great for the flirtatious kind of older lady on the train. You know, looks like somebody who might hit on Liam Neeson, I suppose. I don't know. I don't know his type. I don't know whose type he is. I'm sure my mom finds him attractive. I don't even want to ask. But she definitely is not the right pick for the menacing voiceover character in the other scenes. It's just not believable. Oh, and also another side note, maybe nitpick that I wanted to mention is this guy and everything that he says is obviously ADR'd. It's really frustrating because it doesn't match up his lips at all. They must not have liked his performance, but they're like, oh, we could fix it in post. And they thought they did. And I, and they didn't. Back to the movie. Neeson gets so crazy with his little interviews, he ends up pulling a gun on this girl because he thinks that she's the person that he's supposed to find. She's not. And in a slick, crazy, unforeseen twist of fate, none of the people he thinks are the witness to the crime are the actual witness to the crime. See, if you were paying attention, you would have seen that two passengers earlier in the film had switched seats. He switched seats. They had the wrong ticket stub. It was actually Wait for it. This little girl. Dun, dun, dun! There's no more reason for him to believe this girl's the one than the last girl being the one, but yet he's just as confident this time as he was with the last one. But she is the one, so the movie doesn't really address that. But coming face to face with the person that he's supposed to kill, because now he has to kill this person instead of just identifying them. He just made so many mistakes already. Uh, he can't do it. He's not gonna do it. I don't wanna do this. I thought I had you figured out after all of this, you would choose the life of a stranger over your own family? You must think you're some kind of a hero. I won't do this. I won't do it. I will not do this. I will not do this. I will not. So they use their magical powers to crash the train. <laughs> Which leads to the best action sequence in the movie, and I don't know if it's the best because it's actually good or if it's just so funny. It's really the only moment in the movie where I was actually entertained, and, uh, and I was entertained by this. <laughs> Neeson and this train worker agree to sacrifice themselves so they can uncouple the rest of the cars and they'll crash with the train. Like, they, they have to do it. So says the law of Armageddon 1998. Of course, Neeson has to sacrifice himself because he's the hero of the movie. And this guy has to sacrifice himself because he foreshadowed that he would be dying in the movie whenever we first saw him. The train don't kill me. The people will. But in this bizarre twist of fate, Liam Neeson survives by being thrown... <laughs> from the engine car, Domino from Deadpool 2 style, through the air about 40 feet into the safe passenger car. Wow! wow! And all the passengers, instead of being turned into minced meat, they inexplicably survived the train crash from Super 8. Everyone okay? Of course they're not okay, because... This isn't over yet! We're still in danger! This is when the cops surround the train, and they believe Michael is the one who caused all of this to happen, and they think it's a hostage situation. Now, how many hostages do you have? And yes, that's right. It's his ex-partner who's the hostage negotiator. Seven years we were partners, you always had my back. Hey, that's what he said earlier in the movie. Now I connect. Mike, I get it. You want to do the noble thing here, but I got news for you. There ain't no such thing as noble. But are you ready? Are you ready for one more twist? It was you. It was a cop who killed him. You did this. Doesn't look that way, does it? You set me up. Ugh. How could they have planned this? I don't get it. I don't understand how they could have planned any of this. You derailed a train and took the passengers hostage all because some mystery woman? A lot of powerful people have got a lot to lose if that evidence gets out. They have eyes everywhere, even inside the bureau. I told them to put a witness on your train out, but you couldn't just do what she asked, could you? All right, guys, uh, we're in big trouble. We've got a witness who saw me, a police officer, murder a guy. What do we do? Oh! I have an idea. So, we could make a witness get on a train, right? But then, we have an ex-cop who just lost his job as an insurance salesman, also on the train. Then we send a lady in to give him a secret riddle. We'll put a bunch of different people on the train to make sure he follows through with the secret plan. We could have somebody push one of his friends into the street. Oh, we could have someone give him his wife's wedding ring. Then, in a big to-do, we have him crash the train and everyone will think it's all his his fault. It's so simple. There are just so many freaking ways this could go wrong. What's the point? Doesn't doing this make him a witness and everybody else on the train a witness? Aren't you just kind of perpetuating the problem here? I don't understand. Why? But then it turns out that all of it 
was a plan for Liam Neeson's birthday party. <laughs> That's not true. I had you go in there for a second, didn't I? Because that makes just about as much sense and it's just as plausible as what actually happens in this movie. It doesn't really matter that Mike figured out that his ex-partner is behind all of this because his ex-partner is like, I'll do it myself. Who's Prin? Who's the witness? I'm Prin. She's calling for me. <laughs> But the passengers refuse to give up who the witness is. They have this I am Spartacus moment where they all stand up and say, I'm, I'm the witness. I'm the witness. I'm Prin. No, I'm Prin. I'm Prin. It's gotta be someone. Target is clear. Take him out. Oh, got him with the old switcheroo. And then here at the end, we find out who the true heroes are. I'm Agent Garcia, FBI. Your family's safe. Oh, the federal government is here. Because even though the local police force is entirely corrupt, of course, the beautiful, uncorruptible FBI steps in to save the day. This movie relies super heavily on cliches that we've seen a million times before and ideas and twists and plot points that have worked in the past, but they don't work in this movie because it doesn't earn it. But in one final twist, Neeson tracks down the original girl who I guess is just commuting on a train. You know, I've asked a lot of questions about this movie that don't make sense about the bad guy's plan. And I think this is the movie trying to answer that, but all it does is complicate the issue that much more. You didn't pick me because the witness was on my train. You put her on the train. Maybe you even got me fired. You played us both. I think the best way I could describe it is, you know how in the game, The Sims, whenever they talk to each other, but they don't actually use words, but you could tell kind of what they're saying based on the inflection. <laughs> I feel like that's this movie. The things that they're saying and the plot don't make any sense, but they're said and done and presented with the inflection of a lot of movies that actually do work. So here at the end, it's like this is the moment when he finds the bad guy and is like, checkmate. Except the checkmate line isn't a good line, but it's said with the same inflection that a lot of movies that do work say it. The checkmate music plays and it's like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, but it just comes across so strange and awkward and uncomfortable and not very self-aware. Look, there are a lot, a lot of pointless contrived plot points in this movie. It's unbelievable. But you could say the same about a lot of movies. There's so many movies like this that I actually enjoy. Probably the first one that comes to mind maybe is Speed. It follows the same template, you know, it just fits into this mold. But I love Speed. Not because it's a fantastic story or it, it breaks the mold or anything, but because it takes that mold and it does it right. It adds so much to it and it's fun that you forget that there's so many plot holes and problems and silly things in the movie. They took a pretty generic action movie plot and made it interesting. The fun ride that Speed was made me not even care that none of it made any sense. In this movie, it's just so paint by numbers. It's unbelievable. It, it's frustrated me the whole time I'm watching it and I'm yelling at my wife and I'm telling her why. Why is this happening? The soundtrack feels like it wasn't even made for the movie. It feels like they just picked a bunch of stuff from a music library and tossed it in there. It's not even stylistic in its shots. The closest thing to a stylistic shot is this shot that they just ripped off from Jaws that has been done a million times. When you first see a bus in the movie Speed, they play off the fact that they know that you were there to see the movie where a bus blows up. Buses seem menacing, like, oh, whoa, we're gonna, oh, this is a bus, there's a bus, is this gonna be the bus? When's the thing that I'm here to see going to happen? But in this, it doesn't feel menacing. When you are at the point where you know Liam Neeson on a train, that's about to happen. I could tell, look, look, he's headed to the train. Nothing about this scene from the music to the shot to the way it looks on the faces of the people around, there's nothing foreboding about this scene. You don't feel like something bad's gonna happen, you just know, oh, this is the part where something bad happens in a movie like this. It doesn't feel like I'm waiting for something scary to happen, it feels like I'm actually waiting in line to get on a train. Make it big, make it scary, make it fun, have some fun for once, but this movie feels like nobody involved with it had any fun at all. And I have to say, watching it, I felt the same way. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this episode. Big shout out to my Patreon pledgers, the Barely Protestant Podcast, linked in the description, Jacob and Emily Rugrock, and Amanda Stewart. Seriously, I'm very grateful for everyone who pledges over there. It's a really fun community, and it's also the only reason why I'm able to continue to make reviews. So thank you so much, and thanks for watching. Good night.